ladies and gentlemen. You could have been anywhere else in the world tonight. But you decided to be right here in our beautiful hamlet of New Smyrna Beach, the historic New Smyrna Beach in the colony of East Florida. Are you ready to go back in time tonight? Yes. yes. Uh, I'm going to try something uh, tonight. Um, go in character uh, in a few minutes after I hit my Irish grandfather's shillelagh three times in turn. But before I do that, um, again, just want to welcome you back to this, this city. Um, I have such a passion for New Smyrna. I miss New Smyrna. You know, y'all are living the dream, as it says in the new book about New Smyrna. Um, my, my fascination with Autobahn began, I want to say, about 30 years ago when I came to Florida and I started to realize that he actually visited Florida. I mean, we've heard about the Audubon Society. It's the largest conservation club in the world. But I, I went to Key West, for instance, and found, oh, there's an Audubon house here. And, um, about 20 years ago, I was on a historic jaunt through Philadelphia and went to his famous Mill Grove, um, his home that he moved to here when he was 18, outside of Philly, which is right near uh, the Bartram Gardens, uh, John and William Bartram, who inspired Audubon as well. Um, I remember sitting at Mill Grove on the Schuylkill River uh, that day, and I was all alone, but I was surrounded by the sounds and the chatter of the birds. And I thought, these are the ancestors of the same ones that were here when Audubon saw at this very spot. I left Mill Grove and I uh, eventually returned to my home in Florida. And this is just a typical day in my life. Today, for instance. When I woke up this morning, I live one block from the Halifax River, where he canoed in. And he, yes, shot the birds in. And he met with Bulow that we'll talk about. And I'm a block away from the Halifax, and I walk out of my yard with my beautiful bird dog. I have a German Mustalanda uh, dog, just as he did. And I look up into the highest pine tree that is visual from my yard, and there's the nest of the American bald eagle that I can see every day from my yard and from my upstairs. They come from October through May. They come back every year. They're monogamous. It's just remarkable. I look up, I see the bald eagle swooping down with a mullet in his talons into his nest. A minute later, I look up and this incredible morning dove goes and perches itself on the top of my home. I just happen to have a morning dove autobahn in the living room of my house. He was without a partner this morning, so he cooed and flew away. Took the puppy for a little walk to the river. And as I'm gazing out at the Halifax, this enormous brown pelican goes flying over alone on his way north. That was my morning. That was in 15 minutes. <coughs> God is so good. We live in a paradise. We live in this place where if you just look up and open your eyes, you'll be amazed just like all of us. So tonight I hope to immerse you in some of that spirit so that we can together go back in time I want you to just thank you all for being here today, opening up your mind to our illustrious story of Audubon and these winged creatures that he just loves so much. Welcome to see you this evening. 
Beautiful. Do you want to go back in time and learn about my story? Say, wee wee. Wee wee. <laughs> to the screen, ladies and gentlemen. Ah. <laughs> Self portrait. <laughs> I often think the woods is my only place in which that I truly live, the wilderness, the secret garden full of those winged creatures. I was born in Santo Domingo. Now this was now, this is present day Haiti. The year was 1785. My mother was named Jean Robin. She was a Creole Haitian servant of my father, Captain Jean-Jacques Audubon. My father had a double life. My father had this woman on his plantation home in Santo Domingo, and he had his legal wife back in Dante's front. My mother died when I was six months, and I also had a little sister. The 1780s and 1790s on the island of Haiti was full of strife. Sugar plantations, as far as the eye could see, all under the labor of African slaves. The French owned that island. There was a slave revolt. A gentleman named Toussaint Louverture took over the island with some slaves that hung all the French. Napoleon wasn't very happy about this back in France, of course. So because of the slave revolt, my father encouraged me to move back as a child, uh, back to France with my sister. I'm still a child here. When I got back to Nantes, France, I met my stepmother, my father's true wife. She was 12 years his senior at the home in France. By the age of 18, the reign of terror began in France. <clears throat> now, my memories of growing up in France, my father sent me to a military school. The math confused me and I wasn't interested. Most of the time at the school, I would jump out the window into the wilderness so I could chase animals. My room began to be, look like a museum of animals. My father wasn't very happy. He wanted me to grow up to be a military hero and go and get the degree so I could become an officer in the great Navy and sail around the world. I had other ideas. The animals fascinated me. But by the time I was 18, like I said, France was in the reign of terror. The king and his wife were executed and beheaded during this time in the middle of Paris. Marie Antoinette. I was witnessing all this bloodshed growing up. By 18, my father realized if I was to stay in France, I would be transcripted into Napoleon's army. The French and the English were fighting all over the world, as always. So at that age, my father decided to send me to his property outside of Philadelphia. I remember leaving on the boat from Nantes to come to America. My heart sunk because I knew I would be missing those I left behind, my stepmother and my sister. But as I crossed the ocean, my light and my life was in the new world. I would finally see that when I got here. Napoleon at the time. This is the most famous portrait of the Emperor Bonaparte. And again, he was the main reason why. I, just, I had to come to America. Meanwhile, back in America, 
the Renaissance man, your president, Jefferson, was buying the Louisiana Purchase, by the way, this exact same year that I came. I actually originally arrived into New York City and quickly contracted malaria. Um, some Quaker women actually nursed me back to health. Taught me English for the first time. I'm forever indebted to them. And as I got well, I traveled to the property of my father at Mill Grove. 284 acres of property. He had an overseer. He had a, two other men that were already running the property. But I, I was to inherit all this land. There was a home near mine where I got to meet a young lady named Lucy Bakewell. Her home was called Fat Fatland Ford. English. Now remember, I hailed from France. <laughs> Her father wasn't so much enamored with me as I started to date young Lucy. Uh, the story uh, basically went that I was, I met her father and um, I went to the home, he had invited me to come to the home and he wasn't there at the moment and, and Lucy invited me in, it was the first time I set eyes on her. And I was just enraptured from the moment I did. She was playing the piano as I waited for her father. You see, I was much more prone to frivolity at the time. Charismatic, I love dancing, dress. And Lucy's family is much more of a strict English type. So it was difficult to get her father to realize that I was in love with this young lady. We used to take walks in Mill Grove and go into these caves. Where the first time I actually found a bird in the cave called an Eastern Phoebe. My mascot. And the Eastern Phoebe, by the way, is the first bird in the history of ornithology to be banded so that it could later be identified. And I did that while I was at Mill Grove, about 21 years old. Yes, my study at Mill Grove became a homemade museum, um, and I began to work on paintings. 284 acres is a lot of property for me to jaunt about and explore. It's a painting of Mill Grove at the time. <laughs> the story of my love affair. Uh, these are actual bracelet, uh, necklace actually, that I gave to Lucy and some earrings. They yeah, actually had pieces of my hair in them. This was a custom neck in those days. <laughs> there I sat, my gaze riveted, as it were, on the young girl before me upon meeting Lucy that day at Fatland Ford. <laughs> Not a very glamorous image of Lucy. But she would later write that every bird became my rival. <laughs> Impressed with the pristine natural beauty of my new home, I adopted the phrase, America, my country. Right around this time, I, began, I got citizenship in America. and changed my name from Jean Jacques to John James. It was then I painted the Kingfisher. The Kingfisher is one, I'll show you some of the, that painting. The Kingfisher was one of my first, I wouldn't say masterpieces, but I, I endeavored to make the birds look lifelike. There were other artists before me. Alexander Wilson, for example, world famous at the time. I got to meet him later in Kentucky. Catesby, 
Mark Catesby had written books about the birds of North America before me. But their paintings look like cartoons. Their, their animals looked posed. And my goal was to make these animals look lifelike. The kingfisher is the first time that happened. And I could see where my passion was to lead me. Decided to leave Mill Grove to pursue a general store business on the frontier in Louisville, Kentucky. In these days, Louisville, Kentucky was the frontier of the great western expanse. Again, post Louisiana Purchase. Louisville, Kentucky, the frontier. Now, why I left Mill Grove, there's several things that happened. I had bad relationship with the overseer of the property. Uh, they discovered land on the property at Mill Grove, which we thought could make us a fortune. Uh, and then later realized just to get the lead out and to actually do the work was something I really wasn't interested in doing because I was too busy in the wilderness trying to find specimens. The idea of going to Louisville with uh, my new wife. Uh, so that's what I did. And I, went, I had a partnership with another Frenchman named Ferdinand Rosier. And we went to Louisville to start a general store. Can you imagine my darling wife trudging through what we could later write the, the primeval wilderness on the way from Mill Grove outside of Philadelphia to Louisville, Kentucky? And she trudged the whole way. Strong woman. Boarding flatboats at Pittsburgh, finally uh, reaching uh, the Ohio River. But yes, we were pioneer travelers in a new nation. And yes, the portrait doesn't do her justice. <laughs> From my journals, see, not only was I a painter, I'm well known for my paintings, but as a naturalist and a writer, many were impressed. The birds were objects of my greatest delight. I looked on nature, only to see these remarkable birds in this secret, vast wilderness that I wanted everyone to see in lifelike form. So I was to seek out every new bird that I could. Plato, my dog. <laughs> um, I had two sons. John Woodhouse painted that portrait there. Early days, married back in 1808. We had gone to Louisville, uh, had to come back, had to get the approval of both my father uh, by letter and uh, Lucy's father. Took a little while. We, uh, the marriage was arranged and we went back to uh, Pennsylvania to get married. Next day, back to Kentucky, back to the frontier. Uh, most people who were looking at my life would say that I was a work of ho workaholic, getting up at 3 a.m. most days, never seeing a moment of daylight burn away. I had much to do. Back then, uh, you know, trading in the black satin clothes for buckskins and moccasins, I changed my whole appearance. Gunpowder and a buffalo horn, tomahawk in the belt, uh, in the belt my faithful dog at my side and began perfecting per paintings using position board and wiring. So this is a whole new method of how we're going to document these animals, these birds. Yes, I would shoot those birds. And as they fell, I would take these specimens and then go back to the studio, and I used wiring to put them in positions that they would have normally been in the wild, and then paint them. The wiring was brand new. You know, Wilson didn't do this. Catesby didn't do this. Again, their, their birds were almost corpses in the paintings, whereas I would put these birds into lifelike positions. I did get to meet Wilson. Um, he was, at the time, absolutely famous all over the States, all over the Scotland and the, in the European side. And um, he did visit me once in Kentucky. He saw some of my early paintings. Uh, we actually went out hunting, looking for birds one day. My friend Rosier, who was the Frenchman, whispered to me in French, your drawings are certainly far better. <laughs> the Kingfisher, by the way, that last one. This is also a self-portrait about the time, just an etching. <laughs> this is an etching. I would later have the dream, of course, of painting every single bird in North America. This is a tall order, of course.
etching of what I changed my appearance. Notice the bird on the back. Moccasins, coonskin cap, buckskin. <laughs> yes, yes. My whole life uh, was filled with my passion for rambling. I was accused later of several things. Um, but back in Kentucky, I, had a, I went bankrupt. I was jailed for bankruptcy from that general store mishap. Um, I could never just sit in the store and sell merchandise. merchandise. It just wasn't in my blood. Um, I, yes, I left my wife and children over several months to seek out the birds. So, I mean, but this passion for rambling consumed me my entire life. Um, again, attempting to run the store on my own, I invested in land, lumber, steam mill, steamship. Nothing was successful. By 1812, my second son was born and became a citizen. The war in America with, with England again, War of 1812. Now we have a president named Madison, and we're at war with England again. Some of you know some of that history. A burning in D.C., a Star Spangled Banner, Francis Scott Key, Battle of Baltimore. A new young hero wins of New Orleans. Andrew Jackson, old hickory. By 1815, my daughter Lucy uh, was born. I lost two infant daughters, and she died at two years old. In 1818, my father died in France. I let, he was left me with no inheritance since, again, I had been a bastard son. Some of you know another bastard son from the Caribbean, probably. <laughs> Alexander Hamilton, who later becomes an illustrious American. In 1819, investments fail. I sell everything except my gun, my dog, my clothes, and my drawings. I was jailed briefly for bankruptcy, and a second daughter died at seven months. I was depressed say the least. Uh, by 1820, we had moved to Cincinnati, where I took up taxidermy. I did a lot of portraits, made signs. There was even a brief period where the custom was painting recently dead people, and I was hired to do that several times. Anything to make a little extra money again for my growing family. October the 12th, 1820, I'll go down the Ohio and the Mississippi to fill my portfolio with visions again of publishing a book about birds. This is the moment of my life where I realize this is going to be the rest of my life. I'm going to seek out every bird in North America. And traveling all the way down to Mississippi to New Orleans is the real beginning of that. My darling Lucy, who passed when she was two. <laughs> my passion was for a rambling, they say. <laughs> Bird on my back here in this portrait. Um, this is uh, later when I get as close as I could to the Rockies, went west even. Traveled through most of North America at the time, most of the known parts of, uh, of the states, seeking a new bird with every morning. Ah, and Lucy back home with a Carolina parakeet at her side, <laughs> reading another letter that I had sent. Our letters, you know, are almost as legendary as the Adams and Abigail letters. The Eliza and Alexander letters, the Lucy Knox and the Henry Knox letters, just full of romance and from my end, just full of all the people and the places that I had been, forever promising Lucy returning home someday soon, dear. <laughs> but again, capturing and shooting more birds and painting more birds that I'd never seen before. The Carolina parakeet, by the way, one of the uh, birds that I would later paint that uh, became extinct. Passenger pigeon, another one.
Certainly one of the goals in my life was to search out things that have been hidden since the creation of this wondrous world. Our Creator had given us this amazing wilderness to explore. I found it in my soul to do that. 1820, I arrive in New Orleans. Lucy takes up a job as a governess, a teacher, an educator. There's a place called the Oakley Plantation, which to this day has festivals in our honor in New Orleans. That part of my life, I refer to that area as my happy land, that part around New Orleans. Naturalist thought to be an artist also, yeah. Happy land around New Orleans. Um, one of the things I did then, by the way, as Lucy was a governess, uh, I was hired um, by a wealthy plantation owner to be the tutor for her daughter. And they paid me well. I taught her dancing, I taught her violin, I taught her how to paint, I taught her about science, and the woman paid me rather well until we had an argument about $20. And I decided, I think I'm wasting my time here. I have to get to the other parts of this country I haven't been to yet. The southeast, for instance. I heard about this place that Bartram called the Garden of Eden, called Florida. By 1826, um, oh, 1824, I traveled to Philadelphia and New York, failing to secure publishers for Birds of America. There were two schools of thought at the time. The Alexander Wilson School of Painting Birds and this new guy, Jean-Jacques Audubon. It was difficult to get past the Wilson advocates. I wanted to secure somebody to publish my paintings. And I, fe I found, found no success at that in New York or Philadelphia. Philadelphia being then not only the scientific capital, but the political capital uh, in the United States. This is the place, Philadelphia, the intellectual breeding ground for, for intellectuals in the United States at the time. I couldn't find success finding a publisher in my new country. <clears throat> so, 1826, I departed for England, leading Lucy and the boys in America to wait until I had published the book. I arrived in Liverpool, paintings exhibited, and became celebrated as the American Woodsman. I would dress again, buckskin, coonskin hat, hatchet, musket. Similar to how Ben Franklin had wowed Paris several years before. These people were just overwhelmed with this guy. And my paintings were exhibited finally Indenburg, Scotland was actually the first place where hundreds of people started to come to the shows and look at my paintings. By 1827, I began selling subscriptions of my book for $1,000. Finally accepted in Europe, subscriptions. If you look at the Birds of America, the actual elephant folio, it contains 435 bird paintings. In the back, you will see the, the subscribers. Among the subscribers are the Queen of England. I mean, the, the people that could afford to lay down $1,000 and get in installments the paintings. But finally successful. And when I came back to America in 1829, there was crowds waiting for me when I came off the boat. So much for Wilson and his cartoons. <laughs> you had a new president by then. Old Hickory, that guy from New Orleans, had become the president of the United States. Andy Jackson. And Interesting story. When I went to the White House to visit him again, I'm now world famous, you know, for uh, the book that's been coming out. Um, when I meet Andrew Jackson, we, we got off kind of very well. Uh, he respected me, of course, as an artist and an outdoorsman. 
him being, a, you know, Tennessee, Tennessean, whiskey drinker. Lots of profanity, that Jackson. <laughs> we got along so well, I, re I recall there was an artist in the White House painting a portrait of the president. And uh, one of the days, these portraits took a long time. This wasn't just one city when you see portraits. And one of the days, the president had another engagement. And the artist looked at me and said, you have a statue very similar to General Jackson. And so for two days, I sat in <laughs> as Andrew Jackson. Uh, this relationship later turned to be quite fruitful, knowing President Andrew Jackson. Because my endeavor next was to visit the Southeast and find new birds. And I needed permission to get on U.S. Coast Guard ships, revenue cutters, Navy ships, to help me in my travels. And guess who wrote me those credentials? Jackson and the Secretary of the Navy at the time gave me letters that would introduce me to captains of ships that would take me to the South. This is actually another self-portrait. Um, 1826, drawn by himself. Excellent. There he is! <laughs> Uh, the great Jackson. This, uh, this was done uh, the year after his election, the year of his inauguration, which would have been 1829. President-elect of the United States, so not quite take the oath yet. A fascinating figure, no doubt, the age of Jackson. Imagine having an entire age named after you. I hear you have a, a place near here called Jacksonville. I also hear he never stepped one foot in his entire life in that place. He was in Pensacola uh, earlier. He was the first territorial governor of Florida, fighting the Seminoles. We'll talk about them shortly. Ah! The Mockingbird. Some of the paintings here. So the Mockingbird, and if you notice, the Rattlesnake. Now this one got me into a lot of trouble. <laughs> the Wilson camp said, Audubon's a fraud. Rattlesnakes don't slither up trees. This actually appeared in newspapers all over the country, trying to shame my name. Later proved completely untrue. Rattlesnakes do climb trees. This, this is uh, one of the most famous uh, paintings, of course, Mockingbirds in history. But this particular painting um, caused a lot of controversy and frustration on my part. I was known to elaborate in my stories quite often. Uh, but the veracity of my argument is correct. Rattlesnakes do climb trees. Excellent. The story of the national bird. Um, my little mascot here. So, some of you might have heard of this. Um, you know, Congress famously was deciding lots of things as the country started. Um, and some people would say, Ben Franklin said we should have the wild turkey as our national bird. Now, the research tells something a little different. So, here's exactly what happens, okay? So, in a, here is my painting of the wild turkey. It's the first one in the book, by the way. There it is on the cover. Painted the wild turkey twice. I hear there's some around here. Yes. Um, and here's my uh, bald eagle, perhaps on the Halifax. Big, giant catfish. Uh, so the myth about this conception of whether Franklin said this, well, it starts with a letter that Franklin wrote to his favorite daughter in, in 1784, where he criticized the eagle um, on the Great Seal, and he says, the eagle, this is Franklin talking, the eagle is a bird of bad moral character. He doesn't get his living honesty, honestly. And um, that is generally true. If you watch a bald eagle, they will, they will quite often steal the catfish, the mullet. They'll scavenge from anywhere they can. Literally, in flight, you will watch them attack an osprey and just take it. 
two of them will attack an osprey and make a drop and then they'll take it. So to Franklin's credit here, um, perhaps it doesn't have uh, a good moral character. Um, he doesn't get his living honestly. Comparing it to the turkey where Ben said, it is much more a respectable bird, a true bird, native bird of America, and a bird of courage. That's all he said about it. He didn't say we should replace the bald eagle with a turkey. It's interesting. Um, Autobahn and Franklin defended the turkey, but did not propose it as the national symbol. And again, these are um, the, the famous paintings that are, are going to appear in Birds of America. Come to Florida. Again, this land that I had read Bartram. Bartram wrote a book in, called Travels. John Bartram visited De Leon Springs, Blue Springs, 1760s, late 1760s, 1768. Uh, right around the time some guy named Turnbull was shown up here in a colony. Bartram uh, was exploring over on the west side of your county and um, eventually returned with his son William and they write a book called Travels. Bartram's Travels was a bestseller uh, at the turn of the 1800s. In 1800, you know, people like Jefferson would have had Bartram's Travels and Franklin and so on, on the shelf. Uh, they would have visited Bartram's gardens in Philadelphia. They would have known, everybody knew about Bartram, everybody read Bartram. And in Bartram's account of Florida when he came here, he says, it's the Garden of Eden. I did not find that when I arrived in St. Augustine. <laughs> um, and the story goes, uh, this is sort of the chronology of the, uh, the arrival, November 15, 1831. This is the Florida part of the uh, story. Um, south from Charleston to St. Augustine, five days on a scooter, schooner. Uh, um, arriving, okay, so I spent some time in St. Augustine, and my recollection of St. Augustine was, was not good. This was a dirty city, a bunch of fishermen, quite lazy. This is not anywhere near some of the amazing cities of Europe that I had been accustomed to. Or even, you know, um, so I didn't find what Bartram found immediately in St. Augustine. But my, my vision was to come further south. I mean, I had heard about those springs. I had heard about the keys. And these are the places that I wanted to come all the while looking for birds. On December 14th, arriving at the Hernandez Plantation, Joseph Hernandez, General Joseph Hernandez, was the first United States representative from Florida. And his plantation was called Malacompra, north of Warren Beach, along A1A today. Washington Oaks State Park. So, well, Hernandez welcomed me. We didn't get along that well. He was a bit rigid. Uh, but he, he welcomed me and he, he let me explore the land around his house. And we, we uh, found quite a few birds there. Uh, I left Hernandez's plantation. And on Christmas Day, December 25th, 1831, I left Hernandez's plantation. And I arrived at the bachelor pad of John Bulow. Bulow had the largest plantation in this area, sugar plantation. Bulow at the time was 26 years old and had inherited quite a bit of land. And so he welcomed me there. Um, the Bulow plantation, again, sugar cane as far as the eye could see. And I spent all of Christmas um, with Bulow. Halifax River, December 28th to Live Oak Landing on a hunting trip. One evening, I remember, we were out in Halifax, again, looking for birds that we had never seen before. The white pelican comes to mind. Um, three of his servants, myself, John Bulow, down the Halifax River. Uh, the current put us up onto the, some shoals, oyster beds. It got dark giant thunderstorm. We're stranded on top of these shoals in the complete darkness in the middle of the river the entire night. It was in January and the weather was freezing. And I remember that night thinking, we're not going to survive out here. Uh, but the sun came up and we survived. The, the servants literally had to get out, walk on the oyster shells, pulling the vessels off of the top of oyster shells in the mud. Mm. All of this is um, written down in the episodes that I kept uh, of these experiences. 
Um, January 6th, so the, the new year, rides an Indian pony to Spring Garden, where Colonel Orlando Rees owned another sugar plantation. Stately owned Springs. Um, Orlando Rees was happy to see us. Uh, this, um, the Palmetto Divide between the East Coast, I mean, leaving the Halifax River area and heading due west to Spring Garden. And I had again heard about these springs that come <coughs> bubbling out in the sulfuric, sulfuric water that came in, the clear water, and I had to see these. And when we got there, he welcomed us, and we had quite a visit over there uh, with Colonel Orlando Rees. I, um, I had a gentleman with me named Lehman, um, and when I would, when we would shoot the birds and I would be, begin painting the birds, Lehman would put the backgrounds on the birds. So in, in the backgrounds of most of the paintings were done by a gentleman named Robert Lehman, yeah. And he was with me on that trip. Uh, by January 14th, returning to St. Augustine, awaiting a schooner, schooner to sail down to St. John's. Again, on two of these missions, I, I met with a captain who had a U.S. ship, and he enabled me to get on with my men and fed us, and it was, again, with all those credentials from Andrew Jackson, the president. Finally, leaving St. Augustine on a scooter uh, for the St. John's, February 17th, boat, walk, boat to walk back to St. Augustine by the intro. I have a, a segment here I'd like to reach you from one of the experiences on the St. John's, from what are called the episodes. And the episodes, again, are the journals that I kept about my, my journeys. We were on the St. John's. We were on a revenue cutter called the Spark. Impeccable crews. These men ran this ship. Remarkable. The captain was a great sea captain. But we're going down the St. John's. And it was early morning, it was dawn. I'm going to read you what happened. In the morning when I arose, the country was still covered with thick fogs, so that although I could plainly hear the notes of the birds on shore, not an object could I see beyond the bowsprit, and the air was as close and sultry as on the previous evening. Guided by the scent of the jerker's works, beef jerky. We went on shore, where we found the vegetation already far advanced. The blossoms of jessamine, ever pleasing, lay steeped in the dew. The humming bee was collecting her winter store from the snowy flowers of the native orange, and the little warblers frisked along the twigs of the smilax. Now, amid the tall pines of the forest, the sun's rays began to force their way, and as the dense mists dissolved in the atmosphere, the bright luminary at length shone forth. The sun's coming up. We explored the woods around, guided by some friendly live ochres who had pitched their camp in the vicinity. After a while, the ship, the spark, again displayed her sails, and she sailed and silently glided along. And at that moment, we spied a Seminole Indian approaching us in his canoe. The poor, dejected son of the woods, endowed with the talents of the highest order, although rarely acknowledged by the proud usurpers of his native soil, had spent the night fishing and in the morning procuring the superb feathered game of the swampy thickets. And with both of these, the Seminole comes to offer them for our acceptance. Alas, thou fallen one, descendant of an ancient line of free-born hunters, would that I could restore to thee thy birthright, thy natural independence, the generous feelings that were once fostered in thy brave bosom. But the irrevocable deed is done, and I can merely admire the perfect symmetry of his frame as he dexterously throws on our deck, the trouts and the turkeys which he had captured. The Seminole received a recompense, 
And without a smile or a bow, or acknowledgement of any kind, off he starts with the speed of an arrow from his own bow. We met a lone Seminole warrior in his canoe that morning, and he traded his turkeys and trout. How I felt so sorrowful for that man's race. It's 1832, the Indian Removal Back Act had just been passed. That was on the St. John's River that morning. March 5th, leave St. Augustine again, uh, bound for Charleston, uh, forced to port in Savannah because of a storm. Uh, March 15th, arrived in Charleston at the home of my friend, the Reverend Dr. Bachman. Bachman later, by the way, uh, his daughters would marry both of my sons. He was a, a preacher in Charleston, uh, an illustrious man, um, and he's who we stayed with uh, in Charleston. April 19th, leaving Charleston aboard the revenue cutter now called the Marion. Named after the great Francis Marion. Some of you call the Patriot. Sails toward the Florida Peninsula April 24th, seas Cape Florida Light at Key Biscayne. So we're on our way all the way down to the south. Uh, anchors at Indian Key. Uh, April 26th, visit Sandy Key, Cape Sable, and Mangrove Islands, and finally May 4th, arrival to Key West to meet our great friend Dr. Strobel again. Uh, Strobel was another scientist, our guest, uh, our host at the time for us. Uh, May 10th, the Dry Tortugas. 90 miles off the coast of Key West, of course, are the Dry Tortuga Islands, named after the turtles um, that are just abundant there. Our experiences on the dry tortugas are just remarkable as well. Um, several, ver several types of turtles that were there. Uh, entire industries at this time were uh, harvesting these turtles. Entire industries were harvesting their eggs. By May of 1832, um, I left Florida and Indian Key and back to Charleston. Some of the birds painted in this amazing wonderland of Florida. The Florida Jay, again, um, up to St. John's. The Great Blue Heron. Now, Florida was still a territory at this moment. Florida had become a state by 1845, but when I was here, uh, we had purchased it from Spain um, a few years before that, 1819. Cormorant, <coughs> and the American flamingo. Now, when I painted the birds, and my vision was to put them life size in my book, life size. <laughs> so we had a challenge with the flamingo. So if you notice, I had him crane his neck down when I wired him up, and we painted him. Um, when the book came out, literally elephant folio pages. You would get it in installments of 10 birds at a time. And you were, most people that were subscribers would put them together and eventually you'd have four giant volumes and 435 birds if you continued your subscription. All right, so about down in Key West, uh, one of the homes that I stayed at, this is the marker in front of it. Captain Geiger, skilled pilot and master, built this house. The Wreckers were, uh, were quite an interesting group. Uh, the whole island, the Key West, was founded by these, some people would call them scoundrels. They literally would wait, uh, lay in waiting, and as, as boats went by the, the coral uh, reefs, they'd push them off, push them in to purposely uh, be able to rob and pillage the, the contents of their boats. Um, my experience with the Wreckers wasn't uh, that regard, but I had heard a lot about that. Most of the Wreckers that I met weren't as bloodthirsty as that, or greedy, but this is, uh, again, in front of one of the homes that I um, stayed at while I was in Key West. That's what it looks like from the outside today. There's a ghost in Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps one of my favorite, um, the painted bunting. Um, 
Florida, Florida bird too. You get to see one of those, you're kind of lucky, but it's remarkable the color and the painted bud thing. And of course, we see lots of red crested woodpeckers. So we have a great egret here, and take a look at the green shank in the background. And you may guess where we are here. So in the background, um, the Castillo de San Marcos, the time of the Fort Marion. Um, you know, standing on that very rock today, you know, you'd have the same view. So uh, painted in St. Augustine. Yeah. Green shank. Then Lehman, uh, the artist who did a lot of the backgrounds, uh, is quite accurate. Anybody? Rosie Spoonbill. Rosie Spoon Spoonbill, yes. <laughs> Impressed with that knowledge, yes. Again, Florida birds. Absolutely beautiful. Excellent. Ah! So again, my little mascot here. Bald eagle. Six foot wingspan. Six foot wingspan on the bald eagle. Bald eagle, um, Heliolitus leucocephalus in the Latin, um, meaning bird with a white head, kind of a translation. But uh, the uh, mature bald eagles have the white head. Uh, before they become fully mature, it takes about two and a half years, uh, they're completely brown. So you may mistake one that's actually an eagle for another bird of prey, um, if you uh, see it quickly. Um, Bald eagle. Next slide. So this is an original copy of the Birds of America. And notice the, there's four volumes here, one, two, three, four. Uh, and uh, this particular buyer put them together in this fancy cabinet here. So that's a full set. Next slide. Hmm. So among other people I met in my life um, was Daniel Boone. And so this is interesting, you know, um, in 1810, I'm not sure what exactly was painted, but I described meeting Boone and listening to his stories about the capture of the Shawnee. And some people doubt that I met Boone. He was in 83 years old when I met him. Uh, so this is a portrait I did of Daniel Boone. Some of you know about his just remarkable life, right? And the capture of his daughter by the, the Shawnee and him rescuing her. And so that's Daniel Boone right there. Met him in Kentucky. Next slide. After Birds of America came out, um, there were 200 published. Um, and by this time, of course, uh, world famous. Uh, my next endeavor was to paint the quadruped. North America, those four-legged creatures. Uh, and this, of course, is our American bison. Uh, the American bison right there. So my son, John Woodhouse, and I um, started this, uh, this project to try to paint all the four-legged creatures of North America. 1845, minks. Um, one of my favorites is the Wolverine that John Woodhouse did, and I don't know if I have that in here, but next slide. I eventually bought a lot of property uh, in an island called Manhattan. Um, and um, it was called Minnie's Land. Lucy's nickname was Minnie, my wife. So this is a uh, postcard of the Audubon Estate on the banks of the Hudson. 156th Street in Garmansville, if you know New York. So this was my retirement home. I mean, by this time I had fulfilled most of my ambitions to document all the birds of North America. Uh, my son and I were working on the quadrupeds. I even made an expedition to the West, came home. Uh, but arthritis started to come 
and um, I started to lose some of my memory. And by the late 1840s, I wasn't dexterous enough to actually paint anymore. This is uh, this is the home on the Hudson. Today, I'm still there. Two pictures of it. The property around it, of course, has been assimilated by uh, quite a few other things uh, in the city of New York. So this is 1842. I mean, he's It's one of the last portraits my son made of me. It's a 78 caliber. <laughs> but I was listening to all my faculties at this point. This is a picture of the building in uh, that area today. In New York City. With one of my paintings on the side of it. Next slide. An entire apartment complex. Today, 156th Street. <laughs> <laughs> Heliolitis leucocephalus, uh, the great American bald eagle. So you may wonder what happened to the Birds of America, the original copies. So in 2012, uh, a rare first edition came available, and it was auctioned at Christie's, uh, and it was expected to sell for $7 million. That same edition sold for $12 million recently. One four-volume set of the original book. $12 million. By the 1830s, images were now captured on something called a camera. So this is an actual photograph of me here. I'm in my 60s. I've had a lot of adventures. Yeah, losing my eyesight, my ability to write and paint, still enamored with my beloved Lucy and my sons witnessing the ever-changing world. The things that happened in my lifetime, the beginning of steamboats and telegraphs and railroads, photography. And as this all happened and this progress of America to go west, the, the, the wilderness was vanishing, and I realized that. I mean, I saw that when we hunted the passenger pigeons that day when thousands fell at my feet and they later become extinct. Some say it's ironic because I did shoot the birds so I could document them forever and that the conservation movement's named after me. But on the other hand, I did realize what was going to happen. And I foresaw that with this wilderness vanishing. I became depressed at that at that later part of my life. Uh, Lucy and some granddaughters uh, were left behind to promote my legacy. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Well, Lucy and the granddaughters and my son. Sons leave, uh, leave tell their legacy and tell the story later. Um, although Lucy lives quite a few years after myself. By, by 1871, I passed in 1851. I was 66 years old. 1851 at Minnie's 20 years later Lucy needed some money she had a big property and it was just getting out of hand she couldn't afford it and Lucy took the original copper engravings and brought them to a smelter in New York a copper, <laughs> a copper smelter and the son of the owner of the smelter 
was one at a time melting them down when he realized these are the original engravings of Autobahn's birds. So he stopped and he told his father enough in time enough to save 79 of the original copper. But can you imagine 20 years after my death, my poor wife was selling off the originals that I'd been used to. And my granddaughter's there. Um, next slide. So my grave sits in New York City on 156th uh, at that same place. This is um, the quote at the top. Oh, all ye fowls of the air, bless ye the Lord, praise him and magnify him forever. The God of all creation just gave me an amazing life, an adventurous life, a life full of rambling but a passion for animals. I was able to bring those secret gardens to, to life for millions. Today, the legacy of the Audubon Society touches hearts and minds all over the world. Uh, the front of the grave in New York City today. And ladies and gentlemen, I remain for you, George Alfonso, your humble servant.